Okay, we are live. Um, welcome, uh, everyone. Today is another double act between Bruno Aziza and myself, uh, Bernard Ma. Um, what Bruno and I are going to do every month now is to, at the end of the month, on every last Friday, at what time is it where you are now? Is it eight o'clock? It is eight, exactly. Eight o'clock Pacific time, four o'clock UK time, five o'clock CET. We will be on here talking about the latest technology trends, the latest, really looking back um, a, a, a month and say, okay, what, what, what happened last month in technology? What happened last month in artificial intelligence, in data and all the exciting topics? And um, Bruno is in Silicon Valley, um, in sunny Silicon Valley, um, working for Google. I am here just outside London in the UK. And hopefully we've got a, a pretty global picture um, that we, we can discuss. At the same time, we want to make this as interactive as we can. So please let us know where you're from. Um, join into the discussion if, if there's anything you want us to talk about, if there's anything that um, you think is, is really interesting, or if you disagree with us, if you agree with us, let us know. The more interactive we can make this, the better. Bruno, any Anything you want to add? Oh, well, you did a great, such a great job uh, introducing this. I think the last two that we did, we were planning on just talking for 30 minutes or so. And I think each time we ended up uh, close to, to an hour. So there's definitely a lot to talk about in the technology world. And certainly in January, there were a lot of events and there were a lot of announces and a lot of innovations uh, going on. I think, you know, CES is probably the first one that we want to talk about. But of course, Davos that ends uh, today, I think, is is the last day of uh, of that conference. Uh, both of them uh, virtual, of course, and um, a focus on AI and artificial intelligence and the importance of data. And so, I think people are going to be curious to hear what we think are is going on at those events as well. So, absolutely, lots to discuss today. Yeah, no, and for for me, the January there are always two events in my calendar. One is CES in Las Vegas, and the other one is the, the World Economic Forum in Davos. And this year, for the first time, I took part in those digitally instead of physically, which is a is, is interesting. And um, do, do you have a view of how 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 do you do you think CES, for example, work digitally? So you know, it was interesting because I I don't. Tend to pay a ton of attention to CES because it's primarily a consumer show, and you know I've been in the enterprise, and so in fact the fact that it was digital uh, allowed me to watch more of it, <laughs> I think. Um, uh, and so the, a few trends that I thought were interesting, and probably the most interesting one for me was the flying car. You know, we always wait for that to happen, and uh, you know I blogged about this, and and. Uh, you know, how, how could we get into a world where we will have the flying car? So I think that probably was the one thing that stood out. I think in the world of transportation, for sure. I think um, we are losing Bruno a little bit. Are you? Let's see if Bruno comes back. I think we lost the, the connection. So CES for me is... Um, it is obviously the, the the world's largest show on consumer technology. There you are back, Bruno. I think we, we lost you for a minute. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because this week in Silicon Valley, it rained. And when it rains here, it puts a lot of stress on the infrastructure. And so for the last two, three days, my internet actually has been up and down. And so if this happens again, I'll connect uh, using my hotspot so you guys don't lose me. Um, okay. I was just talking about the trend in CES and, and the, uh, you know, how the, I think the cars are going to transform quite a bit over the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, so I, I, I agree. So this whole transport and mobility, a big, big trend for me in CES, uh, I think General Motors launching their personal electric vertical takeoff and landing Cadillac, which is pretty epic, I think. And, and I, I think we've seen 
passenger drones last year, but now I, I think that they've stepped it up and, and I think the flying taxis, flying cars are definitely on the horizon. Um, I, I think when it comes to mobilities, closer closer to, to where we are today, I think Mercedes-Benz um, launching their, their new dashboards completely without any buttons. So you basically have a, a, a digital dashboard for passenger in the middle console and in front of you, which is very interesting. So you, I, I think giving entertainment to passengers and, and getting rid of all buttons is, is I think, a, a, an interesting move. I agree. And I think, you know, beyond just the hardware changes, I think if you now fast forward to what you want transportation to be like for you in the future, I wonder if the model, the business models are going to change as well. I think a couple of years ago, I said, you know, the future of money and car is going to change in our lifetime. And what I mean by that is, do you really need to own a car? Should you pay for a service that's provided to you by a manufacturer where the car comes pick you up and you know, when you're being transported, you're being entertained, you're not driving anymore, and you don't really own this physical asset anymore. What you're getting now is a service. And so it gives you a lot of flexibility, you might not have to worry as much about um, insurance, uh, or, you know, owning and storing this physical asset. Um, but now you have convenience. And so I think, you know, what's great, and what's encouraging, I think, in this industry is that the hardware is starting to change. Uh, the business models will, I think, uh, occur in the next three to five, five years. And then, of course, the network for charging these vehicles that are, you know, most of them becoming electric is going to be interesting to watch. I mean, as much as in Silicon Valley here, we talk about the electric car, you know, I think it's a really small percentage of cars still. Mm -hmm. So we are just at the very beginning of, of this trend. But I think it's going to transform our life uh, in, in quite a significant way and also how we organize our cities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I agree. For for me, I, I think this whole having mobility as a service is a massive trend that, I mean, as a service is a massive trend overall, I think that we're not seeing just in mobility. But I, I think this is where it really starts to transform it for many ordinary people that, that might not even think about as a service solutions. It started with our phones. And now we're thinking about really big assets like our cars, where you think actually, do I do I need to own a car? And I, I think at the moment, it is challenging to even buy a car because technology is evolving so fast. Especially when you look at the the shift towards electronic vehicles, batteries are changing all the time. They're becoming better almost every six months. There's an amazing innovation, and and it's a bit like our mobile phones. I think even if you think about the Mercedes now having this this whole screen um the whole dashboard is a screen it's a bit like if you now look at an iphone five six years ago that looks pretty old-fashioned so how do yeah. we how do we keep all of this up i mean you, you you drive a tesla that is is being updated all the time that they they've obviously obviously caught, caught on with all of this yeah Does every it make week a difference for you when you see those updates coming through uh, it makes a huge difference i think it makes a huge difference once on the convenience of the car um because every week i get something new to get with the car i i think i think that the rain is affecting your line again <laughs> Bruno. you might want to want to uh connect differently um while you do this um i want to have a look at some of the other uh, trends that i i've written an article for forbes on some of the ces trends that uh, we are seeing and uh, there you are i was just i was just um talking about some of the trends that i'm seeing overall because i i wrote a forbes article and i've got a, a video on my youtube channel that summarizes some of those key trends and obviously last year we had bending screens now we have sliding screens which is pretty pretty cool that you can basically foldable screens but sliding ones are pretty cool that you can just make your screen bigger and it, it works seamlessly i think we've had lots of COVID tech, um, touchless screens, I think was a, a big theme. Lots of sterilization um, equipment using UV that, that sterilizes our phones, our, our keys and, and robots uh, doing UV sterilizations of entire hospitals and airports and so on. 
Um, another big trend that I'm seeing is working and learning from home. So we, from really cool connected fancy office chairs to um, to better screens, better cameras, better everything, and home robots. So for me, one of the the companies. Hopefully, Bruno will come back. I will let him back in now. Here we go. Sorry about that. Now I'm connected through my hotspot, so hopefully you won't experience the issues you had before. Very good. And yeah, so I was just talking about some of the trends, so COVID technology, um, home home working, and um, entertainment, obviously a, a big trend. Um, LG launching their invisible TV, I think what they were saying is that our homes are getting smaller and smaller, TV screens are getting bigger and bigger. So what they're now doing is putting TVs on the wall that are have that there's such good OLED display that you can actually turn them into a picture or even into a pretend window in your in your room, which is pretty cool. Um yeah. and then I for me Samsung I, I think was really strong this year. Um showing of home robots and really cool TVs. I mean, they, they show a robot that can even um, do your washing, empty your dishwasher and serve you a drink while you while you still work. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think there is a connection with uh, the health uh, situation as well. These robots, uh, you know, will not uh, risk uh, your health or they won't contaminate potentially. So, so it, they connected that uh, a little bit to what's going on right now. I want to go back to the topic of the car because I want to make sure I answer your question on how does this change the relationship with the car? I think it changes at least in a couple of ways. The first one is, as you think about the, the car itself, every week you get excited about new things coming into your car. Um, and now you think about your car more as software than hardware uh, because it gains value instead of the old relationship I had with a car, which is the minute you drive it off the lot, it's starting to lose value. Here, it's not just more convenience, but it's gaining, gaining value from at least from how I interact with it. The other piece of it is the car is also becoming more intelligent. You know, I was uh, just showing my, my son. Now it detects when the light goes from uh, red to green and it makes this little sound. So it reminds me uh, to go. And so it's starting to do all these things that are at the border of the car driving itself uh, and you being a more attentive uh, uh, driver. And so I, I think it's not just the technology that evolves, but it's also our relationship with the technology itself that I think uh, will evolve. Earlier, before I dropped here, I saw some great comments of people reacting to what you talked about. And, you know, congestion, you know, flying cars will solve congestion issues. Yes, um, I was just looking at this. I'm bringing, bringing in the comment now. Yes. And I think that's very true. I think, you know, if you, if you live in a big uh, city like Los Angeles, for instance, here in the U.S. or, you know, in France and Paris and, and across the world and India and so forth, where you have a lot of congestion, you know, these services... Uh, will make your life a lot easier. I mean, in the end, we're not looking to really own cars, I think, unless you really like the idea of having this physical asset. I think we're looking for better transportation. And so it's it's nice to see uh, that companies like GM are, are thinking about solving it. The question is, how are you going to manage traffic in the air? And, and I don't know that they talk much about that because transportation is really about the network, network to charge the cars or give you know provide them with gas, but also how we all respect the rules, so we make sure we don't uh, crash into each other. Mm. And so I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, so it, another interesting comment here from uh, Satish saying, um, it's gonna be interesting owning a car or not. So we've got so many new technologies coming along from Hyperloop to, to flying pods. And I, I think one of the first um, towns that was really launching this idea of self-flying drones and taxis was Dubai. And anyone who's ever driven in rush hour in Dubai, it is completely crazy at the moment, not so much, but normally it is. So I, I, I think having this, this is this is not, not an if, this is definitely a when, but you're right, it will be interesting to see how, how we have to, have to organize all of this, having all these flying cars in the air. Yeah. You know, the Hyperloop brings another question, which is this idea of location. There's been a lot of uh, talks about people moving out of, of Silicon Valley. And when I think about the Hyperloop, I, I do think about, okay, how do you organize your life? Because if you can get from, you know, San Francisco, Los Angeles in 45 minutes, do you need to live in San Francisco to work in San Francisco? Because your commute is 
is reduced quite, quite a bit. And we've certainly seen a lot of press um, this past couple of weeks here in January for sure of companies moving out of California into uh, states with lower tax and, and maybe uh, better real estate markets like uh, Texas and Austin and so forth. And so what's your perspective from Europe? I have, of course, an opinion on this, but I want to kind of see how you guys watch this. Uh, yeah, no, so for, for me, this is very interesting, this whole debate, um, because I, I, I think this whole pandemic that we're going through is obviously causing huge harm, but I think it has potential if we take some of the good things that have come within, there are not many, but I, I think from transitioning to working from home has really made people realize that they can be productive. Managers realize that actually micromanaging people and having them in the office eight hours a day is not a necessity. Um, I did an interesting uh, LinkedIn Live yesterday with Dell and, and VMware where we talked about this new hybrid work environment. And and for me, this is an, so obviously companies are now, now be, are very serious about this. We see quite a few big tech companies in Silicon Valley saying, actually, we don't need our um, headquarters in, in San Francisco where we have really expensive real estate. People can work from anywhere, not just anywhere in California, but anywhere in the world. And if this works, why would people want to live there when it's really expensive? And I, I, what, what I'm seeing is that there are definitely some issues with the local authorities in, 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 in San Francisco where people are complaining about some of the service provision that is not as good as it used to be. And people get, get annoyed with this and they, they leave. So at the same time, I absolutely love California. And I, I think yeah. in one of my... I think what is absolutely key is that you have these networks and what Silicon Valley had is that it has this cluster of tech people, innovators, uh, investors, and bumping into people is so easy. So you build these natural networks. Yeah, I think, you know, this trend of, of companies and individuals moving, in fact, if you look at the data, has been occurring uh, quite a bit. I mean, in, in general, in the US, uh, there's a lot of mobility. Uh, I mean, I, I was surprised when I moved here as, you know, uh, I was raised in France, was born in France. My, my um, ancestors came from all across the, the world, uh, Italy and places. So we, we are used to this generational uh, move, you know, but once typically, over a period of 20, 30 years, once a family settles in one area, they tend to kind of stay there. And the U.S. is really quite different. You know, when people go to college, they move immediately. And then after college, they move again. And so there's less this idea of identity to a city as much uh, as we might have in Europe. I'm certainly in France. I don't know how it is for some people that are listening in today. But certainly that is a cultural difference that I've seen is less of an attachment to a particular history of a place and an identity to it. Uh, might be more in the East Coast, but certainly on the West Coast, I haven't witnessed it. I think in general, of course, now it's exacerbated by the fact that we're all staying at home, right? So you're right that, you know, you could easily think, okay, over the next two years, I can move to Austin and I won't see a change. But I do think that there are core advantages uh, in certain areas of, of the US like the Silicon Valley because they are in the intersection of institutions that have been in existence for almost now is gonna be you know, 100 years, right? So you've got the, the venture capital community, you've got universities like Stanford and Berkeley, and you've got around it a set of people who have built companies that are iconic companies that, are, that, are, that have, they might not, in the future be based here, they have a large portion of people innovating. And so when we go back to what could be some our new normal, I think people are going to realize that location um, does have a huge importance in our ability to brainstorm together. And, um, and then we crave as humans in general, this ability to meet each other and yeah. build a relationship. As much as these technologies are great for us to talk here, there's nothing that substitutes me having dinner with you um, and talk about things that are not work related. Um, yeah, I, I, so. I can't. I can't wait for you to take me to another nice French restaurant <laughs> because you, Bruno. Bruno has, I think, he he found every single good French restaurant in every town we've ever been to. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I keep a I keep a list. <laughs> yes, um, and I I want to just say hello to everyone on this 
stream. It's so nice to see everyone joining in from all over the world. Um, hi, Kimberly from Clarksville in Tennessee. We've got Don from Arizona. We've got Farwad from Pakistan. Um, let me just scroll up and down here. New York City, France, Colombia. So it's great to see um, everyone joining in. Um, and people from India, um, from Italy. And people from France. Yes, absolutely. From Abu Dhabi. Well Greece. Yeah, from Jakob, from Germany. It's lovely to see everyone on here. And feel free to get involved in the debate. I'm, I'm always scanning through this. Barbara made an interesting point here saying, why are we talking about transportation when, we are, when we're all co cocooning in our homes? And <laughs> you're absolutely right, Barbara. I, I, I think working from home and I think talking about the transition from from or people moving out of Silicon Valley is, is one of those factors that you can now live anywhere and 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 I I think the places that will succeed in the future as as towns and cities are the ones that actually offer more than just networks they offer really good recreational activities they offer good restaurants good places to visit good nature all of those things and i i, I think if i go down this list california actually ticks many of those boxes good weather so i, I yeah. think it's more plus the network so i i and, and uh, you know, there, there was an article, I think, this past week in The Economist, how are organizations making it attractive for people to stay near them? Uh, and so um, there was an example of um, companies thinking about using their location, their buildings, to provide childcare services for their employees. And so you could see that now enterprises are, are changing their, their approaches and that they do want to at least keep some cluster of population around some certain locations and starting to think about using their real estate more as a place to go work, but as, as a place to also provide services to employees. So I, I do think that um, the world will look more like we're going back to working in person, at least in the mixed uh, area, and that the, the, the fact that you're located in, in an area will matter, I think, uh, to your ability to build a career and certainly you know interact with other humans as we used yeah. to do it. And, so I'm hopeful. For, for me, it's very interesting that actually what we're doing here now, we couldn't really do well before because now everyone is online. People have video conferencing facilities. They have good mics and so on. And and even though we are a few thousand miles apart, we can actually get together and have a chat and involve lots of other people. So building some of these networks is easier than ever before and it's less dependent on location. Um, and, and the fact that online now has become the default, I think, is also creating opportunities. Just like I was saying earlier, you know, I never paid attention to CES before. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, because all the sessions are available, I um, might as well take a, take a look at it. So in a way, our access to information is just made easier. And because now all the conferences as a default are going to be online, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's opening new opportunities, I think, for people as well. So it's not all bad. Absolutely. And for, for me, I... I spent my life flying to different places all across the world to give keynotes and now i can sit exactly here i can have breakfast breakfast with my i can do get up early in the morning do a keynote in japan have breakfast with my my children get them set up for homeschooling and then i do another keynote in in sweden and in the evening i do one in in the us and and this has made me a lot more productive and but i've worked from home for for the last 10 15 years so yeah this hasn't changed the world as much as as others now no. i see people like kurt that is asking that you talk about your forbes article i'm assuming kurt that you're talking about bernard's article um uh, i also wrote one this this past weekend so but i think he's probably um you know, there's been a lot of predictions on AI. I mean, this this past week uh, at Davos, I think they released a survey saying 63% of CEOs said they believe that AI will have a larger impact than the internet. And I know you write a lot about that. So, Kurt, let us know which article you're referring to, uh, yeah. so we can make sure that we can address it. Yeah, and and I, I've I've written a few articles on on some of the the trends coming out of CES. So. So yeah, let, let us know if one written one on on hybrid work. Uh, hybrid work is interesting because this it would be interesting to involve anyone listening here now and say, 
how many days a week do you think you will be working from home in the future? So I, for me, is hopefully five days with a rare exception when it's really worth my time and value and think actually, actually Bruno has found another French restaurant somewhere that makes <laughs> it worth <laughs> traveling by train to go somewhere. Um, in, in other cases, you very often hear this two, three, two, people having two weeks at the weekend, two weeks in the office, three at home, or or the other way around. Yeah, so interesting. So how many, yeah, people are saying seven, seven days working from home. Robert is saying two, two out of five, um, a four out of five. Yeah. yeah so that, that's interesting. Um, and obviously all of this comes with real challenges as well. Some of the discussions I've had over the, the last few weeks on this hybrid work trend is that how, how do you make sure you actually manage those remote teams? How do you make sure people don't feel like second class citizens when they're remote and, and compare themselves to people that, that are in the office and meet the water cooler and have a bunter and have out for a drink at night? It's always, you know, I mean, if when you th thought about what we were doing now, if you were working remotely, you're always at a disadvantage when you're joining a call because you're missing what's going on in the room and so forth. So to some extent, the fact that we're all remote is kind of getting rid of that and everybody's on the same uh, page, if you will. I think when we go back to work, it's going to be coordinating meeting days versus work days. I mean, there's a great advantage in being at home and being able to do focus work and then planning your meeting days and maybe on a Wednesday we're all going to meet uh, and it's kind of your brainstorm day. The issue of course is going to be, well, what if everybody picks Wednesday as a meeting, you're going to run out of rooms in the office. And so uh, there's definitely going to be some coordination uh, needed, but I like the idea of having maybe two focus days at, at home and then three days at the, at the office. So you can uh, collaborate and, and get work done in, in rooms and whiteboards and so forth. Last time you and I talked, we, we talked about technologies like intelligent whiteboards uh, that could allow us to brainstorm, but it's just really difficult to, I think, to emulate the, the real uh, human conversation. So Kurt asked us to talk about both our articles. And so I don't know if you want to get started on your latest one. I could certainly talk about um, the article that I published this past weekend on the difference between the enterprise and the um, the consumer world of convergence. I talked about uh, two trends. I talked about this idea that uh, I called it convergence, uh, schmunvergence, uh, and then hopefully I'm doing justice to it. But um, the idea is that in the consumer world, we're very used to devices coming together. And, you know, I, I think I, I referred to a video by uh, Nicholas Negroponte. He's the founder of the MIT uh, Media Lab, and he talked um, ten years ago, maybe twenty years ago. He talked about the next thirty years how everything's going to converge to one device. We see it today right through our phone. And while I think this is a very, uh, you know, explainable uh, trend, I mean, back then it wasn't obvious, but now it's pretty obvious that our phone is a, a watch and our phone is a, 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 a equivalent fax machine and your email, and it does all these uh, various use cases. What I was talking about is that uh, you got to be careful not to go too far with this trend, particularly in the enterprise. Uh, it's difficult to not get trapped in this idea that if you're listening to a vendor that has one tool and everything looks like a, you know, when you have one hammer, everything looks like a nail. And now they're kind of, you know, I don't think it's malicious, but they're thinking about now they're seeing the world through their one tool and they're telling you everything converges to the one tool that they have. In the enterprise world, you, you got to go and focus on what we talked about uh, in the article is this idea of, you know, core use cases versus corner cases. And so I talked about uh, how artificial intelligence business intelligence are coming together to some extent, but they're not completely overlapping. Same is happening with the enterprise data warehouse and, and the data lake, where there are some use cases of overlap, but they're not completely overlapping. So you got to be careful not jumping into this convergence trend too fast, too, too quickly, and too much, because the investments you're making in the enterprise are gigantic investments, right? Investment in the consumer world you always have the option of going back to your watch, right? And you can own both and it's easy. And the reason for why I have a watch and not a, and not a phone is because when I run, it's a lot lighter to, to have. So, you know, some use cases don't ever disappear. And so that's what I talked about in this article occurred. Hopefully this addresses some of what you wanted us to talk about today is that 
Convergence is a real thing. It does happen. It's, it's uh, you know, you see it more in the consumer world. In the enterprise world, what I'm suggesting is apply some discipline and focus your purchasing decision of technology around the core use cases, not the corner cases. Um, so don't go too fast, too far, uh, because you might regret it. These enterprise investment are, you know, are career making investments. And so you wanna, you wanna have a model for it. Um, uh, which, which brings me to this book here. This is the book I was referring to for every vendor and every CIO is Crossed cross and Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. He talks about this idea of center of design. And so if you don't have a copy of this book, get it. It's a really great book. And it forces this discipline of thinking, what is the core design of a particular core product I'm, I'm, I'm looking at? So I went on a long rant here, but I wanted to make sure that, uh, uh, Kurt, I was taking care of your request here. Um, let us know if, if there's more you want us to talk about on this trend. Yeah, very good. And and so I, I, I'm not exactly sure which which Forbes article you, you want me to talk about. I, I started talking about the, the one on the top five consumer technology trends from CES. I think we've covered everything other than 5G. Uh, we've we, we've seen the keynote from Hans uh, Vestberg, from the, the CEO from Verizon, talking about the importance of 5G and and even companies like Dell, Le, Le, Lenovo, HP, they're all now launching laptops with 5G capabilities, which means you will have amazing connectivity at home, maybe not even relying on 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 broadband that is <laughs> that goes down when it rains in California. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The, the other article I wrote about was on fake news, which I, I think is a, a very important topic that we can talk about because if we look back into January, one of the most significant issues, obviously, and the most significant news was that Twitter banned a sitting president uh, and um, Facebook followed very quickly. So if you have, if you can, not only someone that has 80 million followers and is, uses twitter as as his main aim of main way of of communication but if they can ban that person it really puts into perspective the power that social media companies have but also the responsibility they have because there were obviously security concerns they were saying actually he's, he's inciting violence which obviously goes against um what 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 against some of the rules that twitter has and one of the articles that I wrote about was an interesting startup from the UK. Um, and what they are doing is they're building a product that basically looks or tries to identify uh, how truthful posts are. So they will check the sources, the company called Logically. And so they will highlight potentially misleading information, fake news. And it's an interesting collaboration between using AI and using people to check sources, checking what people are saying. And for me, this is something really important because I, I think sometimes we confuse some of the discussions about social media companies. People say, yeah, you need free speech. Of course you need free speech, but you also need to rein in some of the dangerous mis information that is being circulated a lot of fake news is actually now state sponsored so we need to be very careful and and highlighting some of this so talk, people don't get caught up in crazy conspiracy theories is really important at the same time um letting people say whatever they want to say but i think if this is developing into something that is really dangerous we need to stop this as soon as we can in the same way that i think social media companies have a responsibility to 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 find fake news but also identify bullying and other things and now ai can do this and they're starting to do this so what what's your view on 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 censorship, on social media, on removing Trump. I think that the Twitter also removed the Chinese embassy in the U US from yeah. their, their Twitter account because they were talking about some some ethnic yeah. minorities. So it's, it, I think I think you know. Uh, of course, this is not a political show. This we're, we're worried on about technology, but I think it's it's the the meta conversation on this is what are we doing in terms of information change? You know, uh, information access, and um, you know, it reminds me of the this poem. I was looking for for it. It's a, the you know the, the exact quote is water, water everywhere, and not any drop drop to drink. 
Uh, and it's this idea that we've evolved now into a system where we have a ton of information and we have access to so much more information than we, we did, you know, 10 years ago. And, and the, the, there's a great advantage to this, but there's also a disadvantage on knowing what's authentic or information and what isn't and where the information uh, comes from, who's the messenger and, and how, you know, certain institutions, um, you know, in, in the case of the political arena or in fact using the system to influence your, uh, your thinking. So then you don't know what's true and what's not true anymore. And it, it, I think it goes back to, you know, what types of filters are you applying when you're looking at information? Because it's not just the information by itself, it's the messenger and then what you're bringing to the information as a, as the individual uh, yourself. Um, you know, in the old days that you had filters like particular newspapers that you would only read. And now we've kind of lost that because, you know, you could read something in the exact opposite uh, on, on the internet. And I just don't know how um, we solve that and whose job it is to solve that ultimately. It's, uh, you know, uh, reading your article, uh, I think it's great to see companies that are looking at fixing that because it's not something that human scale is going to be uh, able to solve it, right? You and I cannot go through the entire internet and label what's, what's true and what's not. And so being able to do that at a scalable manner is going to help us, you know, use information uh, to make better decisions. But it is something I wrote uh, about last year, right before the US election, because I, there was so much about uh, deep fake and fake news. I think you wrote a bunch about that as well, where now, you know, you could be watching a video of your eye uh, and uh, lips are moving. And what we're saying is our words that we've never said. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's concerning, um, but I'm hopeful that with companies like the one that you're naming here in this article and other innovations across the world, we'll get to a better place. Uh, it is challenging though, because even in the US, you know, my, my wife was making this comment. I, I listen to French news every, every morning and we don't have, I think, at least when I grew up, we don't have channels that are such an opposed, um, you know, uh, relationship with the information. Whereas in the US I've, I've noticed Hopefully, people in the, that are listening to us that are in, live in the U.S. like I do, that it, there are clear delineations. Like this channel has this type of opinion, and that channel has that type of opinion. I don't know that I could say that about our TV channels in France, and I don't know why that is. Yeah, um, I, I, but, I think this is really dangerous. I, I think this whole polarization of this world that we are seeing at the moment, where you have the Democrats and Republicans not even speaking to each other. I think this mm -hmm. is hopefully something that that Biden can start to address now and and build some of those bridges back because I, I think we've had the perfect storm with fake news and 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 supported by algorithms social media companies were using to serve us news and if you like someone's opinion they will automatically serve you more of that and you very quickly get a very blinkered view of the world um, yeah. so obviously another thing that happened this this month is that we now have a new president in the u.s and what do you think is the impact of biden on technology um for me there's this interesting dilemma we talked about social media companies so do we want to regulate them and I, I i think biden probably would like to regulate them a bit more and rein them in a bit more at the same time if we looked at some of the results that came out in terms of their their company performance this month as well they are currently the engine of growth it is the the amazons the googles the facebooks the 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 apples all the com that they are the companies that are generating huge money at the moment so when the economy is not doing very well you, is this a good time to rein them in what, what's your view on that i think you know they'll they'll get a really good sense of how they organize themselves and the thing that was really encouraging is very quickly when uh he came into power he hired some really uh strong folks for what he calls his science team uh, you know, uh, Maria Zuber and Francis Arnold and and folks that have been involved in how technology can, um, you know, help us run a better nation and the importance of science. And so I think, you know, I don't know, I haven't read the agenda, uh, you know, of the new administration and and how they're, they're 
you know, working with the technology industry in general. But it, it's it's interesting that within days, you know, he's created the science team. I remember uh, when uh, Obama came into power, he had uh, our friend DJ Patil as the data science in chief, uh, you know, create his department as well. So it, it's interesting because I think just beyond just the, the relationship with the government with the industry itself is the question is, how can we work closer to solve the big problems, you know? And, and he talked in his, in his speech when he talked about the science team, he talked about how we use technology to make the economy better. How do we use technology to uh, focus on climate change and, you know, places that, you know, I think the rest of the world is, is looking for the U S to have a position, you know, uh, coming back to the Paris accord, I think is, is a big change in this administration. So I think we'll see a definite change in how, technology is applied to making our life better. Um, and it's, I, I'm hopeful and, and encouraged by some of the announcements, but of course, you know, devils in the details and, and uh, how we can help each other. So, uh, but it's, uh, it's overall fairly positive from everything that I've read. Yeah. And I don't know what people think here in the, in, in the chats, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let us know. What was interesting is that I, I completely agree with you. I, I, and uh, I think the other, event that we can talk a little bit more about that happens that happened this this uh, month was obviously the world economic forum in in davos and i i think what biden is talking about in lots of his um initial talks aligns very well with that agenda and yeah i, I think what was interesting when it comes to tech is that um i, I think he's just he just he's just asked for 10 billion additional funding for security which i think is is very interesting because this is something that i'm definitely seeing um, when we talk about this new hybrid work working from home security attacks are going up i think according to the fbi uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the U.S., they have seen a 400% increase in cyber attacks uh, since the pandemic started. So we're seeing much more attacks, obviously, with people working from home on their own devices, connecting to corporate systems. This makes it much more vulnerable. And I, I think people in general are more vulnerable to cyber attacks because Sometimes we think of these really sophisticated AI enabled attacks, but actually 80 to 90% of, of breaches come from people clicking on phishing emails that pretend to come from their bank or from a colleague. So I, I think creating this awareness and, and investing in cybersecurity, I think is, is vitally important. I think so too. I think now that we are just basically running our life from uh, a browser, uh, we're, we're naturally going to be m more vulnerable to identity theft and, and other issues um, uh, just like that. I mean, you, you had a, an interesting survey, which was taking us to the next level of, okay, so now you have technology and the online relationship we have with applications, that's fine. But now what about what happens when technology becomes uh, a part of our body? And so certainly now you start having worries about the security issue of, okay, well, if I didn't manage the relationship online now, can I really have an implant in my brain or under my skin? And do I trust that that's not going to be hacked? What type of reaction did you get on that, on that question? I, I was pretty optimistic. And, and of course, I'm a technologist, so I'm always maybe more um, optimistic than others. But I said, sure, I, I'll want an implant if it makes my life better. Uh, Daryl Plummer at Gartner had talked about this trend called the neuroformic compute, neuromorphic computing. This idea that you know you could have uh, you know little machines that are connecting with your synapse uh, in in your brain, which sounds futuristic, but in fact IBM has a patent on that already. And so certainly, I, I don't know if it's the next ten years, but in the next thirty years, we'll start seeing things like this. Uh, Elon Musk has a company, uh, Neuralink, that uh, is uh, focused on that on on having technology embedded in your body to either help you or uh, make you better. So your question was, uh, are you willing to have an implant? Uh, I answered yes, but what did, what did people end up answering here? Um, yeah, I can't actually find the results. I haven't analyzed them yet, but have you, have you got the results? Let me, let me put, try to pull it up here. I, I think the question was, would you get a microchip implant? And so 
let me see if I can go to the uh, uh, to the actual. What is interesting is that obviously companies are very ser seriously working on this. And for me, in 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 one of my books, Tech Trends and Practice, I talk about this this the the merging of humans and machines and almost having human 2.0. Yeah. And, I, I think our Apple watches and connected phones and more wearable technology that tracks our heart rate and and blood sugar levels and and oxygen ox uh, in in our blood. I, I think all of this is a step towards this. And and I think having an implant, meaning that your your brain can access the internet and and vice versa, that is scary but also amazingly offers amazing opportunities um so yeah very interesting to see what what anyone listening thinks about this would you have an implant and, and obviously companies like Neuralink are, are working very hard on this elon musk um is ha, ha, is believes that this is an important thing that we need to develop um, what is interesting is that Mark Zuckerberg said that he is not interested in working on implants because implants are not scalable. And he mm. wants to find a way of reading someone's thoughts without actually having an implant. So having something on top of your head somehow. And, and they were able to do this. They were able to, to on a very basic level, turn some of your thoughts into text, which is interesting. And we already have uh, things like uh, prosthetic arms, for example, that you can now control with your brain waves. So, yeah, I think, you know, so I found the, the survey, by the way, I was in the minority. I think it, only 23% of people, you have, you have almost 7,100 votes and uh, only 23 people, 23% of the respondents said they would get a microchip implant. Uh, 77% said they, they wouldn't. I think, uh, you know, there, there's a few ways that you can imagine a world with implants that would make our life better. I think one of them is the, the most obvious way today. It's helping um, millions of people is, is the technology that uh, is helping them, you know, um, if you have uh, a disability. And so it's, it's technology that's augmenting you in, in a certain way. Um, I think there's also situations that are interacting with um, particular uh, devices. I mean, you know, I remember um, when the Xbox uh, shipped uh, its Kinect, and it, this is not an implant, but it's it it changes the relationship you have. And the tagline was "You are the controller." And to me, that's opening the door to, oh, okay, so the interface now is me. And so if now the interface is me, how far can we go with that? And so you know, the first level is of course having an external camera that sees you and recognizes you as, as a human body and now understands the gesture and so forth. The next level might be a headset that you're putting and now you're, you've got HoloLens and, and these glasses that you know, you're getting more information. But as you miniaturize the device, you do get into a, 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 a spot where you have the opportunity to actually have it in your own body uh, all the time. And, and once you have it there, it allows you to do simple things like being an extension of the interface that you would use like a mouse or the connect but it also can optimize certain things that maybe um, in our body are are not being optimized when you have low blood sugar or when you're getting anxious maybe it stabilizes you or you know things that today maybe you take medication for and could hurt your liver uh you know would an electronic device actually stabilize the you know the the chemical uh, dysfunctions we have sometimes in our body uh, rather than just hurting other organs that are not directly related to the problem you're trying to solve um, and, and this is the, this is a clear argument for all of this we already mm -hmm. have this. I, I think google has developed a, a contact lens that can measure the glucose uh, level in your tear liquid and this lens can automatically then connect to an implanted insulin pump that will control your insulin so someone with diabetes can completely automate this this entire process which i i find absolutely fascinating well that's great i wasn't aware of that so that's uh that's interesting i'll definitely look into that i, I do think you know there's of course a scary part of it i think fayad is is saying that is that there's a frightening part of it uh, but there's also an amazing amount of of opportunity 
we can have. I think that the person that said it better was uh, Daryl Plummer from Gartner when he talked about this uh, neuromorphic uh, trend. He was saying, you know, that this is the problem with technology is, is there, you know, there's a good side to it and there's always a bad side to it. And uh, it's up to us to make sure that the majority of the use is, is for good. Um, uh, so we'll see what happens there. But uh, I think you, you hit on the big trend here is that uh, devices are going to be miniaturized and there's an appetite to, in general, uh, across multiple industries uh, to make technology serve us more immediately on a daily basis. Completely agree. And so the, the, the other event that just finished that we, we said we would cover is the, the World Economic Forum. So for me, looking at, at some of the, the key discussion points that, that took place there, I, I think the number one discussion point was how do we actually save our planet? And I think lots of people making the point that at the moment we are obviously fighting the coronavirus pandemic, but if we don't get control of global warming and climate change that this could far outweigh anything we're experiencing at the moment so this is very urgent that we need to address um i, I think fairer economies was a big trend reducing inequalities uh, across um economies across the world i think another big trend and Something that I, th I think we are seeing now playing out in, in, in the digital divide that this is a discussion in this country that takes place all the time where I have three kids at home that all have their own computers, they can access homeschooling, they can listen to life lessons, but there are lots of children that are not in that fortunate position and, and they can't, they have no computers, they share one computer where their parents have to work from home, they have three siblings, they have, haven't got a strong internet connection, so how, how do we level this out and how, how do we just address some of the inequalities? I think another big trend that I picked up at the World Economic Forum was tech for good. This is something I'm personally really passionate about and, and write about. I think my my Forbes post that, that I published this this morning is, is all about tech for good. So how do we actually, as, as combining two of those things is, is saving our planet and tech for good. So if any, anyone wants to read an interesting case study, I, I talk about... Um, a case study that is using AI and 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 citizen science to track endangered animals, which is fascinating. Um, and then I, I think the this whole future of work, how is this evolving? I think we talked about this new hybrid world. What will come beyond the pandemic? How do we do we get a better work life balance? I think is really important. How do we address some of the mental health issues that people have? So for me, the, the three core themes for, for from this year's World Economic Forum were sustainability, inclusivity, and technology, I think. Yeah, and I, I picked up on the, the same trends. It actually was interesting if, if you know, all the sessions are available online. So if you go and search through the sessions and look for data you'll find that the majority of the conversation is what what you're talking about is using data for good uh and of course you know you, you've got great speakers from various governments and so forth talking about their their initiatives um the, the issue of, of climate was really uh you know front and center i think um you know when in the opening of the keynote they talked about five i think of the top five issues we have in the world are actually related to climate Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, creating um, inequalities, not just uh, because of technology, but also because of where you live and access to certain services and so forth. And so, um, you know, those were not, I didn't find that the trends were surprising, but that might be because I already read a lot about these problems. Um, you know, for me, it's 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 always, you know, now what do we, what do, we do about it? You know, um, uh, I've never been to to Davos, but I've been to uh, TED conferences and so forth. And I love the the sessions because they raise the awareness. I always look for what's the follow up on this, uh, so we actually make these changes happen. I mean, it's it's great to uh, raise the awareness of it, um, but there are still millions of people that are are dealing with these inequalities you're talking about. Uh, and so, where are the investments going? So I'm looking forward to reading about that. What what are companies or what are in, or nations like you talked about? you know, the Biden's administration, what are nations 
doing and what amount of, of attention and budget are they putting towards solving these these issues? Those are kind of the sessions that I, that I look for. But the great news is everything's available online, easily searchable, um, and, and the sessions are really, are really quite good. So uh, I advise for everyone to go take a look at it. Yeah, I agree. For, for me, this is one of the biggest shifts now that CES was always this exclusive event that you had to be a, a vendor or journalist. So I was lucky enough to be invited to go there. But now, now anyone can watch it. So they yeah. have an audience of millions of people. And I, I think if I think back going to Las Vegas, what happens is that you're rushing around trying to put your agenda together trying to catch the right sessions and actually this is really difficult and nowadays i could have them all stored on my agenda i could watch them one by one i could pause them i can get a coffee in between and the bits that you don't get is the the little meetings in the corridor where you have conversations but actually again for this we have other technologies i can now hop on a, on a zoom call or a teams call and and have have those conversations offline so yeah it makes it makes the experience almost better it's because you would travel to vegas you're jet lagged it's overwhelming uh, you're missing meetings and so there's all these these points of frictions that uh, might miss might cause you to miss the important stuff here you're in a more comfortable environment you actually might get better information you, it might make you a better listener and better participant uh, to the conference itself so uh Definitely exciting to see. And also it just forces these organizations to make all their content available online, which I think participates in, in solving the problem because the more people are aware, the more they can offer solutions to solve them. So it's not all bad. It's not all bad. I agree. I, I think we've we've covered a lot. We've covered uh, a new president. We've covered uh, people moving out of Silicon Valley. We've covered fake news, CES trends, World Economic Forum. What a busy month we've had. Anyone listening, let us know what you think. Uh, share your comments, share your ideas, your thoughts. Um, if there's anything you think we've missed, let us know. Also, we are going to do this again next month. So at the end of February, we will look back again. And again, engage with us. Let us know if there are any topics in particular you're interested in, you want us to cover. We are trying to make these as interactive as possible. And um, we, we've both been reading through your comments and streams, and hopefully we've addressed most of those uh, questions and comments. And thank you, everyone, for, for being part of this. Bruno, anything else? Thank you. I'm looking forward to next month. It's a shorter month, so hopefully uh, uh, we'll have uh, plenty of you engaging with your questions. But I, I really want to encourage people to do what they've been doing here, which is you know, direct the conversation here. Don't, don't make us go through our topics. Tell us what you want to talk about, and then we'll make sure to pull comments from Kurt and, um, and others uh, from across the world that uh, – Help us learn from each other. You know, the, the point I think of this is not for Bernard and I to talk at you, but it's, it's for us to learn from each other. So um, don't wait for this to engage. Ping us and tag us online on LinkedIn, and then uh, we'll see you next uh, next month. Very good. And, and I think on the screen, you can see our, our handles here for Twitter as well if you want to connect beyond LinkedIn or YouTube. So you, you can find me on Instagram, on, on Twitter, on, on anything else. So we've got at Bruno Aziza and at Bernard Ma. So feel free to connect. We will see you as a little double act again um, at the end of February. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.